So sometimes documentation doesn't tell you really everything that you need to know as far as how to use a Python library. What I do a lot of times is look at the actual original source code from these libraries and also use some of Python's built-in reflexive type commands to really get an idea of how to use some of these libraries that I need to use, but I just don't know from the documentation how to actually go about what I need. A good example of this is the AI gem that's used a lot in reinforcement learning. So I'm gonna just use that as the example of something where I queried the objects and I took a deeper look and was able to find out some information that I really needed. And by the way, if you want more information on AI Gym and using reinforcement learning with it, I'll have another follow-up video where I cover everything that I discovered to put together some reinforcement learning topics for my course. So let's get into this. I'll show you how to investigate a Python library and get needed information out of it. To see all my videos about Kaggle, neural networks, and other AI topics, click the subscribe button and the bell next to it and select all to be notified of every new video. So this is a notebook that I put together that shows you really how to query objects in Python. And we'll even look at some of the source code from a library that I am interested in. We're going to look at the AI gem, but this really applies to just about anything. Now, this is located at my GitHub repositories under Jeff Heaton present the YouTube directory and query objects.ipynb. Let's go ahead and open this in Google Colab, but you can use it from really anywhere locally if you want to. Now for this one, I'm using the open AI gem. AI gem is great, but if you click on its link and you go to it, it lets you play all these cool Atari games inside of your Python code. The problem is in the documentation, there's a lot of details that I would have liked to have known that are just not given to me. Like how can I play one of these games like cart pull? How can my program query it and see really what actions are available to me and what the changes to the environment would be? This lets me create code that is very reusable across all of these games that they provide. So now that we're running in Colab, I'm going to go ahead and run it and we're going to query Jim, which is installed by default in Colab. And it is basically the mountain car game. The mountain car game is a very common one. I am going to open this one up in AI Jim. So here's the mountain car. You can see it here. It's a car that is down at the bottom between two mountains. The idea is to use its motor and try to get up to here where the flag is. The problem is the motor is simply not strong enough. The algorithm is actually pretty easy. And on my class website, I have an example of just using regular old Python code to get it. You essentially shoot the motor straight up, 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 up. When it loses power and starts to go down, you change your direction, throw it in reverse and go this this way so you're using conservation of momentum to eventually get you up that hill now in something like AI gem there are really I think three commands that this mountain car has it can put on the brakes it can go this way or it can go this way so that's something I'd like to be able to query from the object but I was not finding a lot of information on the various things that I was looking for so let's go ahead and run this we're importing gem and this env gem make, that's a command that's in gem that lets me get one of the environments. So I could have put a name of an Atari game in there and had access to that. So I'm gonna show you how we look at the source code to gem and try to find where this is even at. Like how do you find where the make function is or how this all works together. But before we look at examining source code, let's use some of the built-in functions in Python to query this object that we just got back, env. These are the functions that we're going to be dealing with. Let's use callable first. So callable is just a function in Python where you pass an object or really anything, any named object or data that you have access to, and it tells you if it's callable. Can it be called as a function? So callable itself is actually quite callable. But the env object that we got back for the mountain car was not callable. 
Similarly, there's something inside of the ENV object called action space. This tells me the types of action that the car can actually do. That is not callable. It's, it's just a dictionary of data that comes back. So if I wanted to actually verify that, I can just do env dot action space, run it, and it basically is giving me, we'll see how we can look these up too in AI gem, but this is a discrete object, which is an AI gem thing that it it's, it's returning to you, but it's not callable. If you try to call it like a function, you'll get an error. Discrete is not callable, but this lets you know programmatically if it's callable or not without getting the big ugly error. Now there's a function that AI Jim gives you called render. Now that is something you call, so that's callable. That draws the current frame of the game onto the screen. Dir is really useful. I use this all the time. D-I-R-E-N-V, you run it. It gives you a list of all of the functions, data that are inside of an object. The double underbar ones, which have specific meaning to Python, like class, less than or equal, less than. You can see which ones are available. I can also see things like action space, class name, close, compute reward. These are all specific to OpenAI Gem, and these are things that I may want to look at. I was particularly interested in action space and observation space because these are things that I just wanted more information on. Get attribute. Well, these are all attributes. Some are callable, some are not. If you call this, it returns one of them for you. This is exactly the same as calling env action space. Global variables, once considered evil, I don't know, dynamic programming languages and some of these newer modern programming languages, globals are not as hated as they used to be. Python uses global variables like crazy. You'll see a number of global variables that were created in the process just of importing the library of OpenAI Gem. Other ones that I defined, like when I created the ENV object. But this is a way just to get a listing of all of the global variables and attributes that have been defined. You also have a local namespace, which we'll get to in a second. So you have a global and then multiple local namespaces as you proceed down the stack. Has attribute. This works like get attribute, except if you call get attribute and the attribute doesn't exist, you're going to throw an error. This just gives you a way of checking. This is like the in command in Python, but this lets you find find out if this variable name actually exists, this attribute. So if I run it on the bad function name, it returns false. Whereas if I had simply tried to call bad function name, I would have gotten this error. ID, I don't use this one a lot, but every time a new object is allocated, it gets a new ID. So this lets you know if two objects, even though they're equal, they might be different objects, instances inside of Python. Like I said, I don't use this one a whole lot, but this does give you, you can think of this as almost the memory location that the object is stored at, although that's really not what it is, but it's it lets you know if two things are stored in the same location and might have the same reference pointing to them. Local works a lot like globals. If you just call locals here inside of the top level, it does the same thing as globals. If you call it inside of a function, there's a lot less going on. So here, this function my local equals 10, you see we just have that one local variable defined. This is a real useful one. Type lets you know literally the hierarchical type of it. This can be used to help you find something inside of the object. So one thing that I was looking for in particular in OpenAI Gem was how many episodes, so how many frames does it allow before it quit? I noticed that it returns something called done and we would just loop through step by step, but I wanted to know at what point it would actually give up. Most of these games are 200, but some of them are different. So I wanted to know where that was coming from. And I basically just ran this and I can call it, but let me show you how I actually found this variable. So where is max episode steps? I could just grep for it if I knew what it was called, but I didn't know what it was called. So I found out that you had something called specs, which instead of gem dot 
get the environment, you can get the spec for the environment. So let me show you how I unraveled this. So it's not really mentioned too well in the documentation. There's a little more documentation here, but it was not really giving me everything I needed. So let me show you how I kind of ripped this apart. Usually in a Python library, you're going to have something like this. You'll probably have a requirements txt. In this case, you actually don't, but they have some examples and the examples are great. I learned tons of things from examples, but sometimes I have to go deeper. So I'm going to go into Jim. There's also no requirements TXT file here. Usually you would see it at the parent directory, but the things to look at right here. So when you do import Jim, you're importing this. And the first thing that I always want to look at is this double underbar init py. This sort of gets the package going. You usually have one of these for each sub package as well. So if you go into ENVs, like we're going to do in a second, you'll see that there's one there as well. But if we look at this, when you do import gem, this is really what gets called. First of all, these are all the other libraries that Jim needs, and it pulls those in, and these are used internally by Jim. This all double underbar, this is very important. This is controlling what gets exported to you. So when you import Jim, you don't just get all this stuff dumped into your address space. You get just what is here in all. Now, if you don't have an all, there's a default mechanism that tells it what to, I believe it imports everything that doesn't start with an underbar, but I usually don't depend on that. I like to actually put this in here. So these are the things that are coming back to you. So remember make and spec, those functions that we called right out of gem. I did gem.make, gem.spec. That's available because we're passing them right from here. So they're they're being imported, so they're available now in this script. But since I'm putting them in make, these are all the things that you can do gem dot. You can do gem dot env, gem dot space, gem dot wrapper, make, spec, and register. These are all very important. And I initially didn't know what they all did. So the thing that I was particularly interested in were the environments. So what I went to is I went inside of the environments. Actually, I'm going to leave that one open as a tab because this is important. We'll come back to here later. So if we go into gem, so if we go into gem envs, and the important thing is, because this is a little different if you're used to Java or something like that, you might think you can just do gem.envs. That's really not how it works. The only reason you can see part of ENVS, actually you really can't even see ENVS because it's not part of the all. So you can't just do gem.envs. Other things. It's only what's available here. So inside of ENV, from gems.env, you're importing make, spec, register. You'll see those inside of here. So the first thing I do, because I'm inside of ENVS now, so now that I'm inside of ENVS, the first thing I do is go down here and look at init, because that will be executed automatically for me. I can see that we are pulling in some things from registration. This is a file that is at the same level of ENVS. It was on the previous page. I'm importing all of these because now I'm going to call this register command over and over and over again. This register command is what creates all these environments, all these games that open AI Gem is able to play. So now I'm getting a little bit closer to it. I later learned that these are actually specs. And look, there's that maximum episode spec that I was looking for. So I'm kind of reverse engineering this, figuring out how I can get to this from my code and then hoping they don't change it in a future version, which which they might. But this is how you, you get it for this particular version. That's why in the requirements TXT file for your own, you specify the version you want to lock it to. So these are all being called over and over. I assume these are being added to some sort of a list. So if I look back here, there's that registration PY that we saw that it was referencing. This is where the register command is defined, which uses these objects here called environmental specs. So when I called spec, that's the class that's really coming back. 
and these are the environments. So each environment is registered. That tells how to actually call it, and the spec gives you information about it. How I knew this is I see these global functions. So there's the register, make, and spec. Those are those functions that are being passed all the way out to the whatever called import gym. So these are these top level functions that you had. And this is how you query the registry. So there's clearly something here called a registry. I don't have access to the registry. Nothing, it's right here, but nothing actually exposes it outside of the library. So I can't really get to it unless I use really sneaky techniques, but those I'm really afraid of breaking changes, taking it out. So, so long as you're using what the author has exposed to you, you're probably relatively safe. So when you register it, it adds it to the registry and and spec lets you use the ID and query it back. That's how way back in my code here, I knew that I'm able to call gem.spec and get the mountain car back. So this is important because it's inside of that ENVS directory. You don't do gem.envs.spec because that's not how that init.py file actually exposed it to you. The other thing that I was very curious about was the action space. So just to show you, if I insert another one of these, and I do env.actionspace. So it's discrete and it's three. Discrete means that it is definite values like Boolean, on or off. And there's three different values that this discrete object has available. So that's basically go one way, go the other way, go forward, go reverse, or stop. Those are the three discrete actions. If I look at mountain car, this is the mountain car that I'm trying to query. So actions, I saw, okay, great. There are three discrete actions that you can do. And the observation, so that's kind of the state, is what position is the car at and how fast is it moving? And I see that this is discrete and this is a box. Okay, my time as a computer scientist student told me definitely what discrete means. It means it has very stable... It has very well defined. It's the opposite of continuous. It's distinct values, whereas continuous is, is an entire range. Although technically in computer science, since your floats are 64-bit numbers, depending on the operating system size, it even a float is really discrete because there is not an infinite number of numbers between one and two when you're using a double, but that's besides the point. But nonetheless, I was very curious about that discrete. I know what that is, a box? That's not as clear to me. A box, as it turns out, is basically multiple continuous values that have a defined min and max. That was not really covered in the documentation to OpenAI Gem, so I had to kind of go in and figure that out on my own. How I did that, was by poking around in the source code like we did before. And if I go back to the top, so in the very top, spaces. This is what tells me how those work. So discrete and box, that's where they came from. Now, how did I know that they were here? That came from looking at the car and looking at the imports and then looking at the inet double underbar net PYs and slowly raveling my way back to here. But this let me look at things like box and there is comments in here that help you. A possibly unbounded box, specifically a box represents a Cartesian product of closed intervals. Essentially, you can think of this as just a list of continuous values that you're going to use for the particular game that you're playing. So this is some general things to look at for this. Definitely look at the underbar underbar init PYs because that tells you where the all is. And this really shows you how this spider web fits together. This is very different than other languages that I've worked with like Java, where pretty much you can guess where a class or object is going to reside based on its package name. C++ is a little more like Python, where you can do a lot of magic in those header files, and you might not find things really... The name of a header file doesn't tell you what CPP file it's going to actually be in. So this is a lot less predictable than Java. And for Python, I like to be able to know how to unravel the libraries and learn where stuff really is and how to use it. Thank you for watching this video. I hope this information is useful to you. The next time you're wondering how in the heck a Python package is actually working and need to get under the hood and take really a look at that. 
If you find this interesting, please subscribe to my YouTube channel. Thank you very much.